Thank you, Connie. Uh, so yes, I'm going to introduce Quart, and I was going to introduce it as a, a sinker alternative to Flask, but in this conference, I think there's, there's so much interest and knowledge already been said about asyncio, I, I didn't feel, really feel I need to explain that part. So instead, I'm going to introduce Quart as an ASGI or ASCII alternative to Flask. And uh, I'm, I suspect this is more unfamiliar. In fact, can I ask if people know what ASGI is? Oh, that's actually pretty good. I was, I was thinking there'd be very few people. Great, okay. Well, I maybe don't need to say this either, but uh, <laughs> I'll try and introduce what ASCII is as well. Uh, but before I get to that, I just thought I'd say a little bit about myself. So I work for Smarkets. Uh, you may have heard me introduce Smarkets yesterday. Uh, you can find me as P.G. Jones on GitHub and GitLab, but I don't have a Twitter, sadly. And uh, you can, I use this avatar so you can kind of identify for the, from this. And uh, just a bit of an interest, I used to be a particle physicist working down this mine in Canada. So that's what the avatar shows. So anyway, uh, onto the thing that's really interesting. So I think to introduce Quart as an alternative to Flask, I should probably just introduce Flask and make sure uh, we all know what it is. I suspect you do. But this is a kind of the, the canonical quick start example for Flask. I think it really shows off just how nice an API Flask is. And uh, you see here, I have a simple root, which is the root path. And any request that goes to that root is going to get this rendered template, the index.html, back. And this is essentially all Flask is. It's a micro framework. It mostly routes requests to the root handling functions and then formats and returns the responses. Uh, if you want to do anything more than that, uh, there are no batteries included like Django. You have to go out into the ecosystem and look at the various extensions. And Flask has a really good ecosystem, so you're going to find extensions for the stuff you want to do. And uh, yeah, this is, this is pretty much it. Uh, it'd be good to just, there's not much to it, but to remember it, because I'll, I'll show you the Quart version in a bit. Uh, the last thing I should say about Flask is it's a, it's a very mature project now. It actually reached version one this year. I think it's very stable, very heavily used. Okay. So to start to talk about ASCII, I'm actually going to start talking about Whiskey or WSGI. And WSGI is the kind of specification or the protocol, if you will, that allows the server to be separated from the framework and allows you to choose different servers depending on what you want to optimize for. And the reason, particularly for Flask, you want to do this is that if you put expose Flask to the outside world, it's not going to scale particularly well, and it's going to be quite easy to attack and bring down. So what you typically use is a whiskey server. I personally like Gunicorn, which I combine with Eventlet, which means it's now going to be asynchronous and concurrent, and I use that with Flask. And that's going to scale nicely, and uh, it's, it's going to be much harder to bring down. For alternatives, you can use like uWhiskey, and you can use various different asynchronous workers as well with Junicorn. Uh, so that's what Whiskey allows. And Whiskey, if you don't know, it kind of boils down just to this, really. It's a single callable, uh, your application. And when you call it, uh, the Whiskey server will pass an environment, which basically is a dict of everything about the request. Uh, it also contains information about the environment meant that the uh, request is working in or the, the application is running in. So like the environment variables, the root path, that kind of thing. And it passes it a callable, which can be called to start the response to the uh, client. So a Whiskey server will get a request from a client, will call this uh, application callable, and then wait for the start response to be called. And then this application will return the body of the response. That's basically what it is. It's a synchronous system to uh, respond to HP requests mostly. And it, it's proved really well. I think it came out early 2000s. Uh, there's lots of frameworks based on it and there's lots of servers based on it. And I think as a user in the Python community, you've got a lot of choice because of this. And uh, it's pretty good. So uh, now I can tell you what ASGI or ASCII is. And it, it's the same principle. Basically, you have an ASGI framework, in this case, Quartz. And you can use various ASGI servers or ASCII servers. And it's the same idea. You split the framework from the server. And as a user, you get your choice of what framework features are important to you and what server features are important to you. And that's the basic idea. 
SGI itself stands for now the asynchronous server gateway interface rather than I think it was the web server gateway interface, which is Whiskey. And it's a bit more complicated, but the principle is still exactly the same, basically. So your application now is a double callable. So the server will call it once and pass it something that's called the scope. And the scope is very similar in principle to the environment. It tells you everything about the request and the kind of environment you're working in. And so you get the scope. And then it calls it again in an asynchronous way. So it awaits it effectively. And this call is, gets past two additional callables, a receive and a send. And these are both asynchronous as well, so you have to await them. So now, as you receive the request, of course, the request body doesn't all come at once. You have to await it in chunks, which is helpful if you want to stream a request body. So you, event, you await the receive, and then you send stuff back to the server, which it sends to the client, which again, you await. So this is fully asynchronous. Uh, these two functions are likely going to do I.O. So when they're doing it, your event loop's going to go do something else. And this, if uh, all the asynchronous uh, web frameworks that exist adopt this, will allow you to choose whichever framework you want and whichever server you want based on that. And uh, this is how Quart is now. Quart is now an ASCII framework. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it's that simple and you've now got a good idea what ASCII is and how it comes about. I think it's a very legitimate uh, equivalent to Whiskey in the, in the asynchronous age and could even perhaps, because uh, asynchronous coding makes a lot of sense for web servers, could even come to replace it in the future. So the last thing I wanted to say right now about ASCII is that you have, you have a bit of choice already, which is kind of nice. There are three ASCII servers that I know about. There's Hypercorn, Uvicorn, and Daphne. And uh, Hypercorn and Daphne both support HTTP2 straight away. You really don't really need to do anything. They just do HTTP2. For the most part, you can't even tell in your framework whether it's HTTP2 or not. Uh, Hypercorn goes a bit further and also supports server push, which I'll talk about later, and also allows you to return a custom response to the WebSocket upgrade request, which could be useful if, say, you want to authenticate that route and return 401s. Uh, there are some extra differences. So Daphne, is, I think, is very heavily used in the Django channels community, and I believe it's quite robust because of that heavy use. Uvicorn is very quick, as far as I can tell. It also has by far the best logo, which I decided to put up. And Hypercorn was originally part of Quart when I split it into ASCII framework and server. And Hypercorn, I think, is the, the most complete feature set of, I think, things that are useful. So that's basically your choice of what you want to do. So uh, those are the, that's the ASCII part. I'm going to come on to Quart now, uh, but to motivate why Quart exists, I just wanted to bring this up again. And it's something Dave Beasley, I think, brought up in his, call, in his talk. And the, the basic concept is that it's quite easy to run or to get asynchronous code to, to be called from an asynchronous coroutine. You just await it. It's also very easy to call synchronous code from an asynchronous coroutine. You just call it. It gets very hard when you try and do it the other way around. When you have a synchronous function, and you try and call another coroutine, it's going to work because you're calling a coroutine function. But all it's going to do is create a coroutine, and it's just going to sit there and do nothing. So it could be quite misleading and take you by surprise at the start. It doesn't error or anything like that. So when you first come across this, the next thing you'll inevitably try and do is then await it, which is going to be a syntax error. And this, this is, the, I think, the problem that really forces these additional libraries that now exist that are just async compared with the existing ones that were sync. And it's the motivation for Quart. I started by locking into Flask to try and see if I could bring asynchronous stuff into it. I couldn't, and that's why Quart exists. So to introduce Quart, uh, you can find it on GitLab uh, under my namespace. Uh, the current release is 0.64, which I released about a week ago. Uh, it's got a nice logo, uh, someone uh, at Coda, Coda, sorry. Uh, made for me, which is very nice. Uh, it's MIT licensed, and it requires pretty much the latest version of Python. And I might upgrade it because there's some nice features in 3.7 I want to use. Uh, it's been in development for a little over a year now. But the real thing that I think makes Quart interesting is that you can take your existing Flask code and the API, the, the framework API, is exactly the same. 
So all you need to learn and worry about is the asynchronous parts. And if you take that original example, you can just find and replace flask with quart and add the async and await words where appropriate. And this can take a bit of uh, getting used to, but basically you want to await any function or any call that you think might do some kind of I.O. And that's, that's basically the rule for it. So uh, just to emphasize, the, the thing I think makes Quart useful is you can just find, replace, flash with Quart, add the async and await, and that's your transition. You just need to learn the asynchronous parts, not the framework. And uh, to emphasize how I'm doing this, like Quartz, its aim is to exactly match the Flask public API, which includes the Verksug public API in a lot of places, if you know about how Flask works. And it tries to match the Flask private API, especially the bits that are well used. And so that's how they relate. Uh, I'll come back to later on how they could relate into the future as well. Another example, of, just to kind of emphasize this point, if you, uh, if I took this little snippet off the Flask snippet sites, it's just a basic authentication system. And all I had to do to make this work with Quart is just add the async keyword and the await keyword, and I'm done. Hey, so having said all that, and uh, hopefully convinced you how easy it is, and I have to tell you how hard it is as well. <laughs> and uh, it's a bit misleading. So if you imagine now that you want to do something serious in Flask, it's not batteries included. You're going to want to reach out to some extension, probably some kind of database thing or maybe cores or something like that. And your extension code at some point will probably do something like this. It will call a, a function that is, in fact, a coroutine function. And in Quart, the request.getjson is a coroutine function. So much like earlier, this data is going to be a coroutine. It's not going to have a key index. You're going to get an error. And so the extension is not going to work. If you were to have this extension work for Quart, you'd obviously need to have it be an asynchronous function and await it. Now, there is a way around this with monkey patching, which I can talk about later, but uh, monkey patching has its uh, concerns. So, uh, so now you know the caveats of it, I'm going to tell you some of the things you could do beyond Flask now that you're really asynchronous and the framework understands this, this idea of asynchronous, being asynchronous. And the first thing I'm going to talk about, which I think might come to Whiskey soon, and possibly in Flask, or probably in Flask as it does, is that you can stream a request. So if you're sending to a server something that has a very large body, you can now stream that, and your server can do stuff with that data as and when it arrives, which could be useful for streaming. And uh, to do it in Quart, you, all you need to do is asynchronously loop over the request body. Uh, that's it. So I've added a timeout as well, because this is a very easy way to attack servers, uh, simply that you keep promising to send data that you never do until you exhaust all the connections. So that's why you want the time up, but that's it. And I think this is one of the things that Python has quite nicely, that it's quite an expressive way and quite clear way to, for this to work. So of course, if you can stream requests, you can stream the response as well. Uh, and as of 3.6, you have these asynchronous generators of which the send events it is. So in this case, in the ellipses, you can imagine that I'm getting data from, say, a Redis pub sub or maybe some other place. And then I'm turning it into something called a service sent event, which, if you don't know, is a way that browsers can just hold open a connection to a server and just get events sent to it. It's very useful for notifications or maybe news and stuff like that. And then I yield it, and I yield the raw bytes, and Quartz going to send that to the uh, to the client. And with the right headers to tell the browser what's going on, i.e. that it's an event stream, uh, this will this will work as you think it would. And again, I think it's the asynchronous generators makes this quite a nice and clear uh, bit of code. Going further, again, HTTP2 is no longer like HTTP1, which is fairly synchronous. It, it is asynchronous. You'll get many requests go over the same connection. It'll pipeline them. And so HTTP2 fits really nicely with asynchronous coding. And the ellipses here are just to demonstrate that like, you can use HTTP2 with Quart without even needing to think about it. It'll just do it if the ASCII server does it. Like, there's, there's nothing for you to need to do. Quart also allows you to go a bit further. And I mentioned briefly earlier the idea of uh, push promises or server push. So 
Uh, to explain how that works, if I'm a browser and I make a request for an index.html file, when I receive that file and I pass it, I'm probably going to find out that I now need to go and ask for some CSS from, for some JavaScript. So HTTP1, I now go and make those requests. And uh, HTTP1, I think I can make about five of these before they have to complete and I can make the next ones. With HTTP2, as a server, I know that the client's going to ask for these. So I can send these files to the client before it knows it needs to ask for them. And this is what a server pushes. So in this case, uh, for space, I said that the index.html is going to ask for the CSS file. And so the server is going to push it to the client. And so when the client knows it needs to get it, it's already got it. And you can make the time to first load of your page much quicker this way. I actually haven't seen this used much in practice. So I think it's quite interesting. But there we are. And I'll add here that uh, I've written some blog posts which you can go and visit to find out more details about how this works if you're so interested. Carrying on, beyond Flask, there's uh, WebSockets. Of course, Flask can do WebSockets as well, but it's usually done by using Gvent, and you have Gvent workers going on. It's a very simple principle. Uh, but in Quart, it's asynchronous. It's just built straight in. And what I've tried to do with the API is make the WebSocket API the exact analog of the request API. So you can get the headers of the requests from the WebSocket object. You can get the query strings, the cookies, all that kind of stuff as you'd normally be able to get. Also, if you know Flask, there's stuff like the before requests and after requests, and you get the before WebSocket and after WebSocket analogs. But uh, the very simple thing to show for an echo server is just have a while loop. Uh, every time the uh, client sends you some data, you just send it back. And uh, again, there's a blog post if you want to read more about how you can do more advanced patterns. Uh, because of course, this one here, you'll need the client to send you something before you can do anything, which may not be what you want. At this conference, though, uh, if you saw the WebSockets talk, which is very good, uh, you of course know that uh, WebSockets are used for tomatoes and cats. And so this is, uh, I had to take out some of it because I couldn't fit it on the slide and be readable. But this is how you might do something like the uh, tomatoes and cats in court. And uh, this is the talk, if you want to see it, it was really good. And if the author's here and wants to see the rest of the code, then uh, I'll be happy to talk to them. OK. So those are all some kind of snippets about how you can go beyond Flask with Quart. I just emphasize you can do everything you can do in Flask with Quart anyway. So this is just extra. There are, and to, to, the other parts that you'd like to do with Flask really come from the extensions. And I'm not going to go into details about it, but Quart has a system built into it that will monkey patch the existence of Flask. So a lot of the Flask extensions you can use in Quart. And if you visit this website, you can find out which of Flask extensions will work with Quart if you use this system. Uh, there are two pretty common ones, though, that don't work with Quart that now uh, there exists some extensions to do instead. One is Flask Cores, which there's a Quart Cores equivalent. And one is, oh, well, pretty much all the RESTful Flask extensions do not work with Quart. So there's this Quart Open API, which has been developed to replace that. All right. So I'm jumping around a bit, but I'm trying to tell you about different parts of Quart. So Quart is a fully type-hinted uh, website, uh, framework, sorry. So uh, every part of Quart is type-hinted, and you can use your tools, MyPy, for example, against Quart to figure out if you're doing the right thing. And I think one of the places where this is really helpful, and something I tripped over a lot with Flask, is knowing what you can return from a root handler. Because there's quite a lot of different combinations, and depending on the combination, it will interpret it a different way. So for most people, you return some string with maybe an integer, which will be the status code, then maybe a dictionary, which will be your headers. Uh, you could return an asynchronous generator or a normal generator or a whole response object. You could then combine the response with, some, with a dictionary, which overwrites the headers, or I think adds the headers. And so all of this, I think, helps if the type hint is there. I think it's one of the great features that Python has added. OK, so those are all the reasons why I think you should use Quart. But everyone always asks about benchmarking. So I thought I should talk about benchmarking. And so this is a really simple one where you have a root that just returns hello. It's a hello world. It's a get request. And on my machine, if I set this up, I can get about 500 requests a second with Flask. If I use the Daphne uh, ASCII server, I can roughly double that. Uh, 
And also, I can roughly double it if I use EventMet with Flask. If I use Quart on its own, I can uh, do slightly better, I get about 1,400. If I use Quart with Hypercorn and UV Loop, I can do better still, about 2,500, so about five times Flask alone. And I should also mention that Quart, by default, is Hypercorn, but without UV Loop. But if I use UVCorn, which is the fastest ASCII server, then I can do even better still, do about 3,500. That's not a very good benchmark, though, because nobody actually has a simple web server that returns hello in production, I think. Uh, instead, you're much more likely to have something like a CRUD app that talks to a database. And so what I've compared here is Flask with GUnicorn, Eventlet, and PsychoPG against Quart with Hypercorn, UVLoop, and AsyncPG. And AsyncPG is very quick. UVLoop is very quick. They're the same people. I think you already spoke about them. And you can see quite a difference here. It's, it's a factor of three, roughly speaking. And this is quite nice. It's a, to me, it's, a, it's an additional thing. It's the async features I want, and this is just a bonus. I, I should probably update this as well, because with UVCorn, it will probably be quicker still. So to talk about the future, I've, I've started talking with the Flask authors. It would be great if the two could merge in some way, and we try and get async stuff directly in Flask. Uh, it also has been suggested that Quart and Hypercorn support Trio or Curio, much like Junicorn supports Eventlet and Gavent. And also, I'm open to suggestions if you want to make them. So I'll conclude by uh, hopefully I've convinced you that ASCII is an async equivalent of whiskey and very good at it. And hopefully you think Quart is useful. So if you want to suggest any contributions or bug reports or anything like that, that'd be great. Thank you. So I think there's a few minutes for questions, if anyone would like to ask a question. Uh, I, I'm sure you were expecting this question, but, uh, well, first, nice talk. Uh, what about Sanic uh, compared to Quart? because it's somehow the same approach, uh, trying to be more or less compatible. Uh, did you try it? Uh, about, uh, because it was not a being on merge mark, and mm -hmm. was, I'm curious. So SANEC is, in the ASCII sense, both ASCII server and framework. It, it does it all, effectively. And uh, it's not, it doesn't match the Flask API, but it's similar to, so you still have to new, learn a new API. Mm -hmm. And uh, benchmarking-wise, it's much quicker than Quart, uh, even with UVCorn as your ASCII server. But there are lots of reasons why that is. So you, you start to make quarters fast. You can start by disabling some of the attack protections. So there was an article put on Reddit about how you can bring down Sanic servers fairly easily. You can't do the same with Quart. But if you turn them off, you get some performance back. In fact, I tried to build a prototype in Sanic of my current service in Flask. And I don't know why, but it becomes slower. Oh. Uh, I don't know what I did wrong, probably something. <laughs> so you can, uh, it's quite easy to get caught out with async doing blocking I.O., so maybe? Maybe it was that. I use the same page, I used uh, async Redis or yeah. AO Redis, but I don't know what I did wrong, but it was slower than. Oh, okay. So the, the results were comparable, so I could compare the two API results and were the same, but it was slower. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Yeah, usually I found Sanic is I will try. quicker. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I will take one. Thank you. Okay. Hi, great talk. Uh, since you mentioned also considering uh, to move it more together with Flask, mm -hmm. just want to let you know there is some work being done on making also Werkzeug more async friendly, mm -hmm. such as making the request parser to not do I/O on its own, but some ways apparently working better with async. Mm -hmm. So it might be interesting to look into maybe even contributing back to those parts. Yeah, definitely. Because, yeah, I guess eventually it would make sense to have, since Flask and React like, want to support uh, async anyway. Yeah, I think one of the things I've seen in the form pass is to make it sans IO. And, yeah, sans IO, uh, that's the current yeah. open pull request I meant, actually. Yeah, so that, that's, that's pretty ace, that is, because then you can use it however. I mean, the HTTP parser that uh, Hypercorn uses is H11, and a pretty, I think everyone uses Hyper H2 for HTTP2. Both of those are sans IO, so yeah, that really helps. Yeah. It would sure be interesting to have you pass around maybe in the Flask IRC channel, pop on Freenode for those things. Because oh, cool. yeah, sometimes there are discussions related to it, and it would probably be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Thanks.
Hi, uh, I have two questions. First off, um, I saw that uh, the Quart app was <coughs> launched with uh, app.run. Uh, so is there a way to run a Quart app without having Quart uh, drive the event loop? Uh, yes, so normally you'd use an ASCII server instead, so Hypercore. Uh, if you want to directly control the event loop, you can pass the event loop to Hypercorn and say, use this one, and it will do that, if, it, if that's what you're asking. If you really want to do it yourself, uh, then you can just use the ASCII interface and write your own ASCII server effectively. Okay. Uh, the other one was about uh, HTTP2. Uh, do you know of uh, any... Uh, any front-end web servers that uh, support uh, prox uh, reverse proxying HTTP2? Uh, so I think Nginx does that. I, I think no, it, they definitely they explicitly do not. Oh, okay, then I don't. <laughs> okay, because I was wondering, uh, do you want to run this uh, quart directly again on the internet? I think hopefully with the ASCII server you can, yes. Okay. Uh, so... Yeah, I do that myself. I thought Nginx did it, but I'm being misled by it. And uh, At so, least yeah. last time already did not. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So I think there's time for one more. One right. more. Um, so uh, a Flask uh, has the test client. Mm -hmm. uh, does Quart also have it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty it, much is the it, same. Is it, a, is it an async or an uh, asynchronous uh, a client? The, I'm trying to see. It is async. I'll try to see if I can show you. Uh, we've got a few seconds. What if there's internet? What it looks like? Because I haven't got a slide. But yeah, it's pretty much exactly the same. So there you go. So you create the test client, yeah. and then you just do a wait the get right. instead of just a normal get. All right. Cool. Um, another question. Uh, uh, Maybe a bit related. Uh, are there any uh, uh, async over uh, RAMs already, like SQL Alchemy? There are. So there's the one I think I like the most, but I haven't used it so much, is Gino, mm -hmm. uh, which declares that it's not an ORM, which is, I suppose, a bit misleading. <laughs> uh, and there's a, there's a few others. I think Peewee has an async version. And uh, there's one more whose name I've forgotten. But it, it's not clear yet which one. I'm not sure which one's the one I would choose in production. All right. I tend to just use async PG and SQL statements. All right, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. I think we're out of time. <laughs>